right. Welcome, welcome everybody. We're uh, here with uh, two special guests, uh, Ben Zen back again. Welcome, welcome, sir. Hi there. How are you, Sean? And uh, we've got Daniel. Daniel, good to see you again. We uh, we met back in what was it June, I think, in, in Toronto. Yeah, yeah. Nice to see you too. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for inviting me on your show. Oh, uh, a pleasure to have you. Pleasure to have you. So, um, Vin Zen, do you want to give a, a brief introduction to yourself? Uh, first of all, hi there, Daniel. Nice to be on the show with you. Um, yes, I'm Vin Zen Kaosan. Those who don't know me, I'm a Bitcoin uh, trader and a Bitcoin user. Uh, I don't just uh, huddle and trade this stuff. I, I use it all my life. And um, I do a lot of education in the space uh, through writing and now specifically training uh, investors and traders in my workshops in Thailand. So uh, thank you very much, Ben Zen. So Daniel, when I asked uh, you how you'd like to be introduced, you, uh, you, you, you simply said Bitcoin emperor. Yeah. So, <laughs> over to you, sir. Um, uh, well, uh... Uh, I started doing uh, the the Emperor of Bitcoin because uh, I thought that everybody that I could see around me was a complete phony. So I decided to be the biggest phony. <laughs> okay, fantastic, fantastic. So uh, guys, yeah, I've, I've obviously asked you for a few uh, few talking points. We've got some interesting uh, uh, subject matter here. Uh, obviously, Daniel. The audience uh, that I primarily look at, looking to appeal to here are, are, are people new to the space. So I think it'll be great if we could start off with uh, a fairly basic overview of, of Bitcoin for everybody uh, and then uh, obviously progress into uh, maybe some more technical subject matter. So on that note, Daniel, maybe do you want to start off by telling us what, what Bitcoin is to you and your, your journey in the space so far? Okay, well, uh, uh, I would say that Bitcoin is a, a computer network that uh, Im implements ideal cash uh, plus uh, an, an industry called mining that, uh, that acts as the, um, the, uh, the, the managers of this ideal money. Okay. And uh, obviously, we met at a Bitcoin SV, Satoshi's Vision Conference. Uh, could you give us a bit of a background on uh, how we ended up uh, meeting there? Uh, obviously, you've been in the space for a very long time. Uh, talk, us through, talk us through your progression. Oh, okay. Well, um, I first learned about Bitcoin in 2009 from uh, Ross Ulbricht when, when he was developing the Silk Road. And uh, I told him that it, it wasn't going to work uh, because of the regression theorem in Austrian economics. So I didn't know that, I didn't know what he was up to at the time. But in, uh, in 2013, when they arrested him, I realized that the, the Dread Pirate Roberts was the, uh, the person who first told me about Bitcoin. Uh, and um, so my, my objection was that um, uh, money has to, well, a, a good that becomes money has to have an initial value according to Austrian economics. And at the time, uh, there, there, Bitcoin wasn't being traded, and so it had no price. So, I, so I said that it wouldn't be able to develop a price. But after it did, uh, I realized that uh, my objection had been met, and I didn't fully understand uh, why. But, uh, but I also realized that if it if it did work, it would it would take over the world, and it would become the the world's money. Uh, because um, uh, money is uh, um, is a uh, the, the value of money is uh, the, the network effect. So, if the Bitcoin network can can grow when it's small, it's it's actually getting better the bigger it gets. 
So uh, as, as it grows, it's, it's better competition against the other currencies. So if it can grow when it's small, it can grow even easier when it's bigger. So um, once, uh, uh, once I knew that Bitcoin trading had begun uh, on, on Mount Gox, then, uh, then I decided to try to learn as much about it as possible. Uh, and I eventually realized that Bitcoin does have an initial value uh, according, just, just like in the Austrian uh, regression theorem. And the initial value has to do with mining and it has to do with the, the demonstrated opportunity cost of a partially inverted hash. Because uh, the hash proves that somebody is using energy to get Bitcoin. And that is an initial value because somebody else can, can see that the energy was lost by somebody else to get Bitcoin. So he knows that he could potentially offer that person, that initial miner, uh, a better value uh, to get some, some other kind of work out of him for Bitcoins. So the fact that, that the partially inverted hash exists proves that uh, you, could, you could negotiate something to get something useful out of this initial miner. Oh, so that's really just the beginning. Uh, but um, so uh, in, in 2013, uh, some, some friends and I uh, noticed, well, th th that was after Satoshi Nakamoto had, uh, had disappeared. So, and there was kind of, um, uh, there was some kind of talk around to try to downplay the, the origins of Bitcoin. Uh, and uh, we thought that was a bad idea. So uh, we, we decided to uh, scrape all of Satoshi's uh, posts from Bitcoin Talk and put them on a, a website to make them easily, excuse me, available to people. And we called that the Satoshi Nakamoto Institute. And we also included uh, Satoshi's citations and a lot of earlier cypherpunk stuff. And I also, uh, uh, blogged on the site and um, um, but uh, 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 later on the Bitcoin community was uh, split over um, over ideas about uh, about the the future of Bitcoin so uh, what happened uh, was that a different um, um, the, 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 the history of Bitcoin split uh, and uh, uh, different, different groups believed that different sets of rules were going to be more viable in the future. And uh, this, uh, well, it, this was called the block size debate, but, but really there was a whole lot of, whole lot of stuff um, about the rules of Bitcoin that were in contention. And uh, long story short, eventually uh, uh, the, um, the, the big blocker group uh, got, uh, um, they, they split again between uh, Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin SV. So we, we met at the Bitcoin SV conference uh, because uh, well, I don't know why you were there, but I, I was there because I, I think that Bitcoin SV is, is really the only viable future for, for Bitcoin. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for uh, telling us about your amazing background. Uh, Vincent, maybe you could uh, go over your history in the space for us. Um, I could. Can you guys hear me? There's a lot of traffic noise behind. Yeah, you could. Fine, fantastic. Um, the uh, summary you give, Daniel, is very interesting and accurate in the way I remember it. And um, that's pretty much uh, how I'd summarize it. It'll take me much longer to say it because one can so easily get lost in the details there. You know, as you said, the thing I liked what you said there was that there was the block size debate and we 
it was such a big issue at the time, you know, 2015, 16, 17. And um, there was actually a lot more going on than just this technical issue. There was uh, what I was identifying as cargo cults developing. There was a social sort of uh, transformation going on. There, there were economic debates about Bitcoin, whether it's even viable or if it's a pyramid scheme. There was so much going on. And um, my own development into Bitcoin really became intense. My, my own growth and understanding of Bitcoin became really intense at that time because I spent a lot of uh, time on the Bitcoin developers list, the core developers list. Um, I was bouncing around Reddit a lot, uh, giving what I thought was informative answers, but really just uh, adding to the maelstrom, you know, of what, what, what was being debated. Um, one only, only really understands it in hindsight. The, um, the, 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 the camps that had developed, I had at the time felt strongly the issue that block size should not increase. And I still stand there and it'll be interesting tonight to, for us to discuss uh, how you see that the, the Bitcoin SV is so viable um, as opposed to the more conservative baby steps um, core sort of path that they've chosen. Uh, for now, I remain 100% invested in Bitcoin, no altcoins, no anything, although I had owned altcoins in the past. Uh, some of the early Bitcoin clones, you know, like Litecoin, and somebody had given me 50,000 uh, doggy coins and, you know, all those uh, interesting things. Um, my path had been to write articles and then to get involved with the developers to understand some of the issues like the uh, the uh, mutability issue, transaction mutability issue. I had to speak to the developers in IRC to be able to write articles about that. Um, I then became an analyst. Uh, I was I had previously been a trader and I was actively trading Bitcoin. Although I always emphasize that one should separate the Bitcoin price from the Bitcoin network uh, and you gave a good uh, summary of it there that it's a network of money that is completely independent and uh, immutable from any authority outside and and from even any authority inside so uh, my path had been, had crossed with the Satoshi Nakamoto Institute because I became interested in the cypherpunks where had Bitcoin come from and uh, I have learned that the cypherpunks um, had for a very long time intended as a means of regaining privacy and, and uh, uh, reclaiming privacy from the state to use cryptography to uh, encrypt, uh, in, to encrypt communications and to encrypt money. And I then saw that since the, the work you did at the, the, the Satoshi Nakamoto Institute, that there was that Satoshi Nakamoto, the person or the group, had been a cypherpunk. We know that we know that um, Adam Back is a cypherpunk, that he's quoted in the in the white paper, and I really began to build up a bigger universe, and uh, it benefited me and I think a lot of people in the world so much uh, to up great our operational security to protect one's uh, anonymity to have uh, uh, an online identity that you cultivate towards specific goals um, and ideals and uh, the end result uh, my view in Bitcoin these days and I'm, where I'm not speaking about price in my involvement in Bitcoin the phenomenon the innovation and, and the future of money is that it is not necessarily there for mass consumption, for mass usage, but an alternative for those who need it. Um, and that is a sort of an axiom that I walk around with uh, as the core of my belief about what is Bitcoin, that it's an alternative for those who need it. But I don't see that so many people who are trapped in the fiat system or that the the, the captains of global finance will necessarily migrate to Bitcoin. Um, 
as a solution for the problem that modern capitalism is creating for us, the, the, the boom and bust cycles and, and the, the very massive credit bubble that we're sitting on right now and the Austrian economists talk about that. So I'll leave it there because I've been speaking for a while and I think that's quite a summary of where I stand ideologically. Okay, fantastic. Uh, yeah, Daniel, to, uh, to uh, answer your question, I was at the, uh, the SV conference because I'm new to the space. I've, 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 compared to you guys, I, 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 it's less than four years, three and a half roughly. Um, my experience when I, when I first came into the space was one of uh, trying to consume absolutely everything I, I, I could uh, read and watch. And obviously there's a hell of a lot to, uh, to learn. Just from a media point of view, uh, I, I felt the the entire space was certainly, um, you know, it was difficult for for a newbie coming in. Hence, hence beginning my media brand to to help people uh, learn the basics. Uh, like like all of us, it's very easy to get addicted to the space once you, to use the term, down the rabbit hole, uh, which I certainly am. So, uh, you know, for me to go along to the BSV conference was really a complete no-brainer. Um, you know, the when I came into the space, the the block size debate was the was the big issue, and, and, and clearly still is. So, my purpose, uh, you know, if I'm creating media for people, I really need to understand uh, what what's happening in Bitcoin. And that's you know that that, that includes the, the major forks. Um, I find what BSV are doing quite fascinating. It's, you know, it's, uh, they were a very welcoming uh, community. Uh, it was uh, incredibly interesting to meet Craig, write and interview him. Um, Steve Shaders, obviously met yourself there, Daniel. So Daniel, could you, on that note, for people who are new to the space, uh, I, don't, I don't think there has been a, a huge amount of, of, of newbies coming in over the last couple of years, but I, I think, uh, they're, they're certainly not too far away. What would you say to somebody who is just joining us? What, what really is the difference between Bitcoin BTC uh, and Bitcoin SV? Okay, well, uh, well, that's a pretty big question. And I already took a lot of notes from uh, what, what Venzin said before. So I, I'm gonna, gonna respond to uh, a bunch of stuff uh, he said uh, as well. But uh, I think that the um, I think the 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 first difference that I would want to emphasize uh, between the two camps um, is the the shape of the network, and uh, um, I, I see a BTC as well uh, the the idea that. Uh, um, that the developers can change the rules of Bitcoin changes the shape of the network. And uh, it results in a, um, a, a, a socialist economy. And in, in Austrian economics, socialism means um, centralized control. Uh, it means uh, central planning. And um, so I see the, um, the, uh, the BTC network as a hub and spokes network with the developers at the center of the network. And all information has to go through the, uh, the developers of the Bitcoin core software. And um, uh, the, the problem of socialism in Austrian economics is um, uh, the, the cost of centralizing all information and uh, computing the, the value of um, any action uh, taken by the central planners. And uh, I see the, um, the BTC developers as um, basically make, making up stuff out of their own heads that has uh, nothing to do with what would actually make Bitcoin more valuable, and uh, I, I see uh, the the people who uh, listen to them as as being like uh, like uh, indoctrinated cult members who uh, who don't 
who don't understand that they're they're destroying the underlying value of Bitcoin. Um, and uh, if you if you don't change the rules of Bitcoin, then you have uh, a network uh, of a, a bunch of um, a, a bunch of people who are all competing to get more bitcoins. Uh, and if they have a certainty that uh, Bitcoin the, the the rules are going to stay the same, then there's a lot more incentive for them to plan far ahead. Uh, and it's this um this this idea that, that the central planners can can change the rules that means it means that that people can't plan ahead because they don't know what the central planners are, are going to do. Um so you the so I see I see BSV as as basically a, a capitalist network and uh, and a BTC as a, um, a socialist network and uh, uh, I mean I I don't think that you should bet against capitalism uh, I don't think that that's worked in the past so and I I still have a few more things from from Vinzin that I want to respond to so the first one is mass consumption now uh, the only viable future path for Bitcoin is global money. That it's the one money that's used by everyone in the world. And uh, the, the reason for this is that uh, it, any situation that has two monies is unstable. And uh, the remember I said earlier, the value of money is the network effect. So I, I see money as a way for a group of investors to invest in one another. That's that's what you're investing in when you have savings. And if there's two different forms of money, you are choosing two different groups of people to be invested in. And if if you just just think about two Bitcoin networks that are initially equal in every way. Uh, it, it, and it, you imagine any kind of initial imbalance between them, like say one person moves from one network to the other. So he, um, he sells his savings in his, uh, his Bitcoin version, uh, version A coin and transfers it to Bitcoin version B coin. Then you've got a tiny initial imbalance between the two networks. But the, um, the the people in the the slightly uh, the slightly bigger network are going to benefit more because now they're connected to more people, and hence there's more opportunities uh, for commerce among one another. Um, now, uh, so so uh, and now in in Bitcoin, there's this need to continuously lose energy just to stay at the same the same position because you need to um need to uh, uh use energy to mine right so in in bitcoin there's this need to continuously grow and uh and out compete everyone else that's much stronger than with a a fiat currency so it's it's much easier for um a bunch of fiat currencies to maintain this in this uh, unstable position with several different currencies at the same time uh, because uh, fiat currencies are inherently lazy but with with Bitcoin there's a there's a need to uh, to keep growing as quickly as possible all the time and uh, the the success course for, for Bitcoin is to eliminate all other forms of money. And that's, that's how you maximize value. So I, I strongly disagree with this idea that Bitcoin is not for mass consumption. And I think the, the only thing that's remotely uh, viable for Bitcoin is all other forms of money are gone and Bitcoin is everybody's money. And if, if you're not going for that, you're, you're doing it wrong. Um, well, yeah. Uh, so uh, I, I have some more notes, but uh, I've, I've been talking long enough, I guess. 
Van Zandt, would you uh, like to respond? I just have to get my sound back. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Um, thanks, uh, Daniel. Thanks for, yeah, thanks for the, the thorough response. And um, I guess what we're doing as we're being real gentlemen and debating, you know, uh, one point to the other and um, that's that's great do you do do you guys think it's useful for me to sort of state a case uh, for um, why core is doing what core is doing and the sort of uh, theoretical problems I see with what uh, uh, SV is doing the, the the idea of a big block uh, uh, going a big a, a, a unlimited block size or a big block size going for uh, with the aim of, of global adoption uh, shall we get into that I can do it in five minutes sure can I shall I give a summary yeah um, with that Daniel? Um, uh, we, we can talk about whatever anybody wants yeah, yeah all basically. right yeah because I, I want us I, I, I would like to then progress uh, to us bouncing some uh, uh, ideas around once once we've we've sort of established the two poles and we know that the truth is somewhere in the middle right and for us to then bounce around there would be really nice uh, for lively conversation as well. Let me quickly make a point um, of how I see core as being a very so, sorry, um, sorry, Van Zandt, stable. You might want to just move your camera a wee bit. We're sort of losing you out of the, out of the corner there. Are oh, you losing me out of frame? Let me let me let me cent uh, centralize myself in the picture. Um, yeah. Put myself in the middle. So the uh, the case for core is uh, sort of ideology and path forward. I like because they have a governance model that's based on Satoshi Nakamoto's golden rule, you know, sort of golden rule. And that is that a change to the code can only be made. Well, this is an ideal, you know, it's a rule. So is it always adhered to? I don't know. But as a, as a guiding principle, I like it. Satoshi's golden rule is that a change to the core code can only be made if there is unanimous agreement and uh, what he calls consensus which is near unanimous agreement about 95 percent and the, as a governance model and this wasn't invented by the core developers it comes from the open source movement that started in the late 60s 70s 80s uh, 90s into the 2000s it was very well developed that a, a group of developers should reach consensus before a change is made. And I feel, you know, as a guy that's reviewed some of the core code and commented on it and saying, I like this, but I disagree with this change because it will impact something over there. And a core developer coming back to me and saying, you know what? I didn't notice that when I proposed this change, that it, it invalidates the whole thing. Uh, except for this part, let's move that into this other proposal that is less contentious, right? So you've got this idea of contention and, and, and consensus. And when there is consensus, when most people agree, not only the core developers, but the, the people keeping them in check, which is all of our responsibility, right? As a user, not necessarily as a trader, but as a Bitcoin user, I should also go and peer review the code. Uh, that isn't, and core developers uh, welcome it. And I think every developer team in the world w should welcome it and probably do. Um, this mechanism, this governance mechanism gives you a very a steady pace of development because any outlying, any wild ideas cannot just be incorporated. Can they be incorporated by, by, by persistent and, and sustained lobbying? Well, perhaps yes, but you know, this is the nature of the world and politics. That's going to happen in any developer team, in any fork or split of Bitcoin. Right. Um, so, I'm quite happy with the with the with the Bitcoin Bitcoin Core's uh, developer governance model. Um, then to go on, I made some notes. Um, are you, am I still with you guys? I got a notice yep. that there was yeah, yeah. an update. Okay, I just want to quickly refer to my notes. Um, 
I won't get into the capitalism thing, Daniel. I like what you said, uh, that the bet against capitalism, I'll come back to that. Not capitalism itself, but the bet against capitalism hasn't really proven successful. And I think that is, uh, as Karl Marx called it, you know, capitalism is one of the biggest revolutions of our time. And, and its, it's uh, captains are to be applauded, I mean, for the success of, of uh, the beast that they've created. Uh, that that's just his comment on it. I want to comment about something else, but before I do, um, I want to get into this idea of um, uh, you mentioned something about, uh, and we both mentioned global adoption. Um, not to argue in any direction, but I would say that I'm okay with a multitude of monies. Purely because we've always had that. And, you know, as we've had a multitude of religions, well, they've caused wars, but uh, they, I think they also have the capacity to, as, as spiritual traditions, to acknowledge that they reach towards the same goals. You know, that, that, that capacity is there. So in terms of Bitcoin having to dominate, you know, sort of in, in, an, imperial, in an imperialist sort of manner, dominate every territory and every transaction. I don't know if it's necessary because, for instance, the guy that works as a teacher, you just take the average guy, he's working as a teacher or a laborer, and he's getting paid in fiat. Um, his area might not have reliable electricity or, or network uh, connectivity. Uh, to force this kind of guy, say, in rural rural Thailand onto a, or rural Southeast Asia onto a network that, that makes it difficult for him technologically and uh, logistically. If, if there are frequent power cuts, I've been out in the, the rural areas, you know, you're sitting days without electricity sometimes. The local cell phone tower's battery runs out because there's not electricity. So you're sitting without connectivity as well. This, um, I just these are some of the things I think about when I say, well, do we want to globalize this thing? If we, I know if we talk about cities, uh, it seems logical and, and good, but there are certain areas that contain so much of the world's population that it's just not viable to do this. And to talk about, I'm talking about the labor uh, in the field. Then if you come to a guy like a teacher who is living in the city, he's getting paid by government and then uh, you know, is, is, since Bitcoin has got anti-state, since the cypherpunks had anti-state uh, uh, objectives in terms of reclaiming privacy and anonymity, is the state going to use Bitcoin to pay this teacher? No, they're going to pay him in the fiat that they can control because they cannot control Bitcoin. Okay, so there's another issue. But in, in terms of this teacher then being locked into fiat in terms of his bank account that he must have and maintain and his credit record in order to receive his salary and use it and the bank can do what they want, the state can do to him what they want. Then we see that it's very difficult for Bitcoin to become a de facto standard uh, and, and be used pervasively. Will it be true in, in, in 20 years? I don't know. Will it be practical? Will it Will governments have changed, become so benevolent and less paranoid or, or, or shed their paranoia of us uh, to, to say, oh, we'll, we'll, we'll accept Bitcoin. Um, will we reach that state in 20 years? I don't know. Will we reach it in 200 years? I don't know. So I think that that's just a practical sort of uh, consideration when we think about globalizing the adoption of Bitcoin? Is it even realistic? That, that's a question mark. Um, I, I tend to think it's not realistic, specifically in terms of this next point. In, in our world, and we, we speak about Austrian economics, and we speak about the Keynesian sort of uh, madness, and we speak about all kinds of theories of money, and we look back at, at trade beads and we look back at the history of money and, and commerce and, and futures contracts that are in the temples of Sumeria and whatever the case may be, we assume that all of this is going to remain the same. Therefore, we project, look in the past and project into the future. And our theories of money 
assume that this globe and this current financial economic state is going to develop as is into either more complexity or more simplicity. I used to think that Bitcoin is going to simplify all of this by decentralizing it. And um, it was an epiphany for me, you know, and eventually I sort of had a a step-by-step -step, rude awakening about that or disillusionment, like, but is it practical? Can it happen? Because, and sorry, I'm reaching, a, I'm taking a few minutes to get to my point. We do face a situation in the future, specifically in the next 11 years, um, whereby climate extremes and an uptick in the, in the, 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 the beginning of the next solar cycle means that we're going to see a lot of solar flares of greater magnitude and these are going to disrupt global electricity networks it's going to cause uh, all kinds of satellite satellite havoc it's going to cause havoc in these cryptocurrency networks too it's going to disrupt the blockchain i i believe that the possibility is there we cannot discount it we cannot rule it out um so here is my point bitcoin is developed to survive such an event um, the mechanism by which it will do so is radio because there is a global ham radio network and bitcoin can transmit across packet radio from amateur radio transmitted to amateur radio operator bounced off the moon or the atmosphere to anywhere in the world and therefore bitcoin core and i'm not I'm, I'm not arguing that core is, is therefore the best. I'm just saying core is, there are people in core thinking about that, about this outcome that I'm saying is possible. And that Bitcoin is designed to continue operating as a money. I remember I used to, it was like a kick in the balls, you know, back in the day I was on zero hedge or, you know, you're on some forum somewhere and somebody says, yes, but when the electricity or the internet goes down, you're, you're, you guys are all messed up, you know, your Bitcoins are gone. And uh, I used to be like, oh, I wish you didn't say that. You know, I don't want to think about that outcome. It's not going to happen. But when I started considering it seriously and I saw the scientific evidence that the global internet can be disrupted and broken for several years, and I saw developments of core being able to operate across radio, I realized that the actual danger is to the centralized banking system of fear and not to Bitcoin, right? So whether this is Bitcoin Core or Bitcoin SV, that's not the issue at the moment. The issue is that Bitcoin in those cases will become a global uh, currency because it will be the only one that is useful, that is transmittable. It will be the, the only network that survives uh, for s several months or several years. That's a consideration as well. You know, so I know this is far out stuff, uh, but this is uh, modern science. This is the reality. Um, and this is where I wanted to link up to that idea. I said earlier that we speak about theories of money going into the future. This is how the world is going to develop. This is what the trends are. I think some pretty radical events, uh, weather events and solar events are going to disrupt that. And Bitcoin whichever one you're on and the one that can go on radio is going to be really useful given that those events never say those events never happen say there's never a disruption to the network then we still have then we have the ideological debate of will bitcoin which fork of bitcoin are people going to bet on even if we go into a fractured future, you know, future of fractured money. There's still US dollars circulating. There's still rural guys getting paid in fiat on a weekly basis. There's still people who are unable to use Bitcoin uh, in some locations in the world, in many locations of the world. Um, this is all very interesting. What do you guys say? Daniel, uh, see Daniel. His scribbling notes there. Um, comment, sir. Okay, well, uh, yeah, there was a lot there. So, uh, I mean, first of all, I already said why more than one money doesn't make sense. So, uh, I don't think that I need to um, uh, respond to anything uh, that that uh, you said about that, Vincent.
but um, um, but I want to talk about um, um, uh, this. Uh, well, I want to talk about how how adoption works because you said you said people shouldn't be be forced to use Bitcoin, but nobody's going to be forced. It's really about giving people an offer that is stupid for them to refuse, uh, which is just the same reason that uh, people shop at Walmart or something like that. And uh, you talked about people not having access to the the internet. Well, it's actually the, the business model of the miners to keep the network running. So um, in, in order to uh, maintain the, the value of the network, um, what, uh, what the miners eventually are going to do is, is bring the internet to everybody. Um, and as to whether governments will want to use Bitcoin or not, uh, it, it, it's really a bad idea to use fiat when you could use Bitcoin. So governments may not like the idea of switching to Bitcoin, but ultimately it'll be too stupid to continue using fiat. And you can't just, you, you, can't, you can't survive uh, by, by making laws that, that tell people to do things that are stupid. Um, so, I mean, I, I think that political power is, uh, is an illusion uh, because, uh, because of this. Uh, and uh, ultimately, people who, um, uh, ultimately, the governments can't do anything about the real future. Like, the future is going to happen how it happens, and a, 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 um, uh, a, a, a system of rules that produces more value is ultimately something that they can't resist uh, because attempting to resist it will just mean that they're going to be poorer. So I think that um, Bitcoin uh, is, is adopted by, um, by, by creating value and uh, you know whether whether people like it or not. That's sort of it's to me. It's really about how quickly how quickly do people figure out which which choices are going to be best for them. Um, and people who who don't want to do that will just end up uh, uh, poorer than than those who uh, who who thought further ahead. Um, and, uh, uh, well, uh, as to your, your point about, uh, solar flares, um, and I, uh, I'm just going to, uh, restate my, my point that it's, it's the business model of the miners to make sure the network, uh, works. So, um, uh, and, and there's, there's a lot of potential value in Bitcoin. So there's, a uh, a good good reason for for people to uh, build networks that uh, that are are able to uh, withstand whatever whatever happens to Earth, uh, and because uh, because BTC has a this centralized system, um, a, a, a system of socialist central planning, there there isn't the same incentive for everybody involved to invest in the network. And so I think that um, most of the miners in BTC are, um, are, not, uh, are not saving the, the Bitcoins that they mine. I think that they're, they're selling them, but I think that they are, um, uh, they're, uh, there's a much better reason for them to invest in in the BSV network uh, because um, there's more certainty about being able to benefit in the future if you uh, invest in a, a capitalist system. In, in a socialist system, everything you have can be taken away at, at any time, and that's that's effectively what what uh, what we have in in BTC. 
because we can, uh, people can invest in the network and then suddenly learn that the developers are going to change the rules, then that, that changes the future value of Bitcoin. And if, if people didn't, didn't know about that beforehand, then they're, they're just out of luck. Could you uh, elaborate on can that? I can, I, can, I quickly, can I quickly just yeah, sure. uh, re uh, two, two responses? Uh, uh, Daniel, yeah, I, I hear you. The, the, um, the sort of dichotomy between socialism and capitalism is interesting there because I believe you're, you're quite correct um, in the terms you use. Uh, the definition of the terms we, we might debate, you know, what is capitalism really, or what is its end, what is its uh, end uh, really, and what is socialism? Is it really central planning? You know, is it really a Politburo the way that that autocrat Stalin set it up for? Um, you know, this is political ideology. We, we don't have to go there, but I just wanted to ask the question because should we face a future where there is a disruption to global networks, uh, whether it's electricity, uh, connectivity, satellite, whatever it is? Um, I believe that neither socialism nor capitalism, that these kind of meta systems, these kind of meta ideas will have any real uh, relevance, will have any r real practical truth on the ground because the, the, the systems that we'll be forced to revert back to, you know, barter and, 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 and community based and almost a Mad Max future uh, would be neither socialist nor uh, capitalist. I, I think there would be elements of both, uh, but the, 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 the reality will be different. Um, so those are just really points I wanted to make, but the, the, uh, just, I just wanted to ask a question. Is there an example where the core developers said, we're going to change the rules, where they were able to change the rules, like pulling the map from under uh, consensus, like where, where the majority did not agree to the change? Is there an, uh, an example like that? Oh, uh, well, but the majority in, in BTC aren't actually thinking ahead about the future. So they're easily manipulated. So it's it's manufactured consent. They're 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 just cult members. Um, okay. in, under under capitalism, everybody has the incentive to plan for the future because they can benefit from that a lot more. Uh, but um, to to me, uh, 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 in 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 BTC, there there is uh, there is a a lack of knowledge about uh, what what the value of Bitcoin is. And okay. Uh, I, sure, I hear you. Uh, I, I, I hear your reply. Sean, you will, I interrupted you. Uh, it will be nice to hear from you because you haven't said anything and you've got a lot uh, to say, I'm sure. You, yeah, you no, guys, look, uh, this, this is one of these vlogs where I'm, uh, I'm very happy to sit back and, and listen and I'm sure the audience is as well. It's a pleasure to have two very uh, knowledgeable guys on tonight. Um, Daniel, question. I've watched a, a, a lot of your content. Uh, you, you really do make some fantastic stuff uh, and have done for a long time. Um, you, you gave a, a, a very good speech back in, I think it was 2014, where you, you said the, uh, that, that Bitcoin was the technological singularity of the, of the cypherpunk movement. Could you maybe talk us a, 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 talk, talk to us a bit around that? I know Ben Zen had a had a, had a question sort of a, a centered around that uh, as well. H have your thoughts changed on that as as meeting uh, the people involved in, in BSV, getting to know Craig? A, a bit, how has your has your thinking changed around a statement like that over the years? Oh, okay. So um, the technological singularity was originally defined by uh, Werner Wenge as the moment when machine intelligence becomes uh, greater than human intelligence. So I'm, I'm kind of redefining defining it there because I think that he, um, he, he, in, he incorrectly pointed out, uh, he, 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 he missed what 
the real big change is. Uh, because uh, Bitcoin is a system that um, creates the incentive for, for all intelligence to uh, merge. So the distinction between machine intelligence and human intelligence doesn't matter as much. And uh, uh, to me, that's going to be the, um, that's, that is a, 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 a more profound change than, um, than the tech technological singularity that, uh, um, that Werner Vinge was imagining. Um, and uh, 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 Bitcoin is also a, a singularity because I think that uh, there is a, a connection between the, uh, the network topology of Bitcoin and uh, the, um, uh, the, the topology of space-time in a black hole in, in quantum gravity. So I think eventually everybody is going to be sucked into the Bitcoin black hole. Um, and uh, this, as to the cypherpunks, um, so uh, like back then, uh, I, I didn't uh, understand uh, qu quite how, um, how different Bitcoin was from the, uh, from the cypherpunk movement. And um, so, um, uh, so the, um, uh, so if, if you look at Adam Back's first post on Bitcoin talk, uh, he, he brags about having uh, convinced Satoshi Nakamoto to cite uh, B money by Wei Dai on the Bitcoin white paper. So uh, what, I, what I see him doing as attempting to uh, attach uh, ideas to Bitcoin um, uh, as as a way of uh, of sneaking them in. So kind of like uh, Ellsworth Tui and the um, the uh, the gallant Galstone, if you've read the Fountainhead. Um, and uh, I think that um, uh, uh, Bitcoin is um, uh, it's a is a, is a related idea to what the cypherpunks we're thinking about, but um, uh, it, it, uh, but but fundamentally, the the cypherpunks had had a very um, uh, a very wrong idea about money, and uh, the uh, what I've seen is that the the old cypherpunks who got into Bitcoin have not not updated their thinking to to understand how Bitcoin is revolutionary. And they've been trying to um, to make Bitcoin more like uh, their their idea of money. And um, uh, if you uh, read uh, um, uh, Nick Zabo's paper, "Shelling Out," uh, um, that tells you about his his idea of money uh, when he calls it a a collectible. And uh, I think that um, shelling out is is very good, but in in light of the the subsequent uh, experimentation of the cypherpunks into money, it, it it seems evident to me that they didn't understand it very well. And the idea of um, uh, the cypherpunk cypherpunk proposals for digital cash cash such as uh, BitGold and B-Money and uh, reusable proof of work is that um, the, uh, the value of what, what is, is being created uh, is proportional to the proof of work that is attached to it. And that's fundamentally a, a backwards looking view of money. And uh, that's really um, just like uh, like the labor theory of value, uh, but money has to be future oriented. So the value of money has to be about what what you think the future is going to look like, not about how it, it was created in the past. But if you look at all of these proposals, they they all 
uh, appear to, um, uh, to be designed with the assumption that doing the proof of work creates value in and of itself. And um, I was just reading Adam Back's paper, Hash Cash, the other day, and I had a realization about it because uh, I could never figure out why he called it Hash Cash because it's clearly not cash in any way. Uh, but it is cash if he was, he was incorrectly thinking about it as um, creating value by doing proof of work. And that's how that's how the other the other uh, versions of uh, cypherpunk money were designed. Um, but uh, it, 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 Bitcoin is um, is a, a, a more more like a like a, a game where you have to predict the future in order to understand the value. And um, uh, I think that uh, what what we've seen in Bitcoin um, since the old cypherpunks got in is uh, many people accepting uh, ideas uh, about the value of money that are not, um, that don't, don't really make any sense, that, that, are, that are based on their, their old preconceptions and, and that are not, not genuinely based on, uh, on projecting in, into the future. Oh, so in, in Austrian economics, the value of money is uh, future productivity. So if you have money, the reason that it's, it's good that you have it is uh, that you will be able to trade it for something else later. And so in order to figure out what the value of that money is, you have to imagine the future economy. And you have to imagine what goods will exist in the future that you can trade it for. And it has nothing to do with the proof of work that was used to um, uh, create it. it well, in, in, uh, in BitGold and B-Money, you create money with proof of work. Whereas in Bitcoin, the, um, uh, the release schedule is set beforehand. And proof of work is used to uh, establish history. So pr proof of work in Bitcoin is, is fundamentally, um, it, it's, it's, uh, it, cre it creates history, but it, it, doesn't, it doesn't create uh, the future. It, it just creates the immediate past, right? Um, and, um, uh, and so anyway, uh, what, what I, what, what I've seen, what I've seen in Bitcoin from the cypherpunks is just what you would expect from people who believe in the labor theory of value, as that they, they turn Bitcoin into communism. So I, I don't, I don't really see. I mean, not not all of the cypherpunks were um, were that bad, but uh, uh, since seeing what what they've done to Bitcoin, um, you know, post. 2014, uh, I, I have uh, down, downgraded my opinion of the cypherpunk movement a lot. Ben Zand, would you Very like to comment? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, it's so interesting. My, my, my mind is spinning in different directions. Uh, it's interesting to listen to you, Daniel. The, um, I agree with you. I mean, one cannot. Uh, I uh, what's the what's what's the word you know when you make an idol when you uh, uh, is sort of uh, you know the, the cypherpunks are not uh, gods uh, they are not uh, they shouldn't become our idols I agree with you um, certainly it was just a movement and part of what we got out of it is uh, the use of cryptography and communications and the use of uh, cryptography and money and and uh, cryptocurrency so that that is fantastic and and how that carries forward is 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 going to be interesting and it's interesting for me to listen uh, I'm going to ask you about that Sean is 
uh, theories of money, you know, uh, Daniel clearly thinks about this a lot. What is money? What, what is value? What, what is the function and role of money? Um, in my own case, it's very practical. It's, it's almost uh, sim too simplistic, but, but what, I base my, uh, what I base my belief on is what I see in reality without projecting it too far. And what I see is this. If I go down to the, the market down here and I want to buy a, a so many fruits, I can offer the I can offer the market trader there a Thai baht and they're gonna accept it if the price is right. And there we go, I've got the fruit. If I happen not to have Thai baht um, because I'm waiting to make a trip to exchange Bitcoin for Thai baht for those certain fiat transactions that I must make, right? I, because if I, if I offer the market trader a Bitcoin, they're not gonna accept it. Even if I spend a few days converting them to it, um, it's not going to be a practical endeavor and they're not going to accept Bitcoin. They're probably not going to know about Bitcoin or have the technical know-how to, to, to make that transaction. The, the other thing that might happen is I offer, if I don't have Thai baht, I offer them a, a Chinese yuan. They are going to say no. If I show them a euro, they're going to say maybe. You know, and that, that's to do with anti-Chinese uh, sentiment, right? If I show them a euro, they're probably going to accept it. If I show them a US dollar, they are definitely going to accept it because, and they will even give me a discount because the psychological impact, the psychological place that the US dollar holds in the mind, in the collective mind of the world is so strong and so powerful i believe it will remain powerful for a long time not because it should but because that is human nature the the, the us dollar in the market has got buying power whereas my bitcoin doesn't you see but it doesn't mean that i value bitcoin less because in another world in another economy i know what bitcoin means if i go if i travel to singapore and i go do a transaction there for fiat i sell bitcoins for fiat I know I can get a good price, right? In that economy and in the Bitcoin world, you know, if I need to send my mother money in an emergency, I don't go to the bank and use fiat because that's stupid, right? That's an archaic system because I've got Bitcoin. I can send it to her without anybody's permission, without anybody censoring that I can send it to her. She's got it within 10, within 10 minutes or within an hour or sometimes a day, but she's got it, right? And then she can use her avenues there to exchange or the fiat transaction she needs to make. Um, in an ideal future, we want those transactions to be in Bitcoin. Will they be in Bitcoin? I don't know. I don't think so. Just because of practical realities that, that I experience on the ground. Um, uh, Sean, what, what, is, what is your view in all of this uh, theories of money and, and uh, the, 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 the practical transition from from, you know, so I'm talking about the meta, the theories and, and then the practical transition on the ground. Mm. Uh, yeah, well, you uh, you've know, got some thoughts on that. Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, you, you and I have had some uh, interesting chats on, on, on the subject, Ben Zen, um, going back to, you know, even, even to some sort of Tyler Jenks' uh, analysis. Um, I've, you know, uh, listening to some of Daniel's talks as well, he's made some interesting points uh you know you, you were talking about mick Carr's law effectively before daniel for, for i guess for me it, coming into this space i've it's been sort of three three and a half years and you know when i when i first came in i've, I've, I've used bitcoin all the time we i was the guy putting up signs that friends businesses bitcoin accepted here showing people how to use it uh you know helping businesses use it you know onboarding a lot of people um, it sort of seems to have come to a, a, a bit of a grinding halt. And, you know, just from a, a personal point of view, uh, you know, putting, putting a lot of time and money in, into the space. You know, uh, funnily enough, Daniel, I was just, just before we, we started recording, I, I, I watched a talk you gave, uh, uh, oh God, it was 2.15, two I think, where you, you and a couple of guys were sort of talking in terms of, of building on Bitcoin and, you know, uh, was it more practical just to actually buy some? 
uh, and, and effectively let other people uh, <laughs> grow the network. Where I'm a little bit frustrated, Ben Zen, and you know, I've voiced this to you before, is I just see the actual use of Bitcoin, you know, the, the, the rhetoric has is, is, is really sort of swung around to this store of value, digi digital gold. Um, am I on board with that? Yeah, maybe. Um, I'm, I'm certainly keeping a really open mind to, to, to what's happening, uh, you know, in, in these other forks. Um, there's, there's a hell of a lot to learn. Uh, but yeah, that is my frustration. And I, I guess maybe something I, on, on that note, something that I, I'd love to get both of your opinions on. And if, if you could maybe keep it as simple as possible for, for people new to the space, obviously the, the block reward halves, uh, not so far away now, what are we about seven months out? Uh, the economic model to me, you know, we, we, we discussed this last time, Ben Zen, be great to hear Daniel's thoughts, but I'm pretty concerned that, you know, the model to me seems like it's built around the, you know, the, the miners being rewarded with transaction fees as that block reward falls away. Um, but I, who's using BTC? Uh, what, what, what does that mean for BTC moving forward? That, you know, there, there's concerns there. What I see from the, the BSV camp is, uh, The, the ability to be a hell of a lot more than a, a, a digital gold. So, you know, am I sitting on the fence? No, I'm not. I'm, I'm really trying to learn as much as I possibly can right now. And I guess I'll throw it back to you guys at this point. Could you maybe talk a wee bit about what the, 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 the halving, halving next year really, really means and, and the big uh, picture, maybe if I go to you first on the, on that, Daniel, the, uh, talking fairly basic terms around the economic model here and your, your, your thoughts around that. Um, yeah, well, um, the, uh, the, the release schedule of Bitcoin um, is, a, is a way of uh, initially distributing, <clears throat> excuse me, the, um, the, the, the Bitcoins. And so, um, so we've had a, um, We've had a, a period in Bitcoin that was like a land grab, where the main thing that people were trying to do was just get a hold of the Bitcoins. Um, but those, those Bitcoins can't, um, can't remain valuable if there isn't future productivity in the Bitcoin economy. Um, and... Uh, because there's no there's no reason to use a a form of money as savings uh, if there isn't something that you can uh, buy for it in the future, and um, and it's the 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 reason that money can act like a store of value uh, is that there's. A, a whole economy of other people who are trying to get more bitcoins. So you 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 don't have to worry that um, people are going to to stop trying to get more bitcoins in the future. Or I should say, if if you don't have to worry about that, then you can use Bitcoin as a store of value, uh, and you you keep it for a while and you can expect when when you need when you need something then you'll be able to get rid of it easily and um it's uh, uh in in um if if there isn't a reason to think that you can get rid of it easily then there isn't a reason to have any of it now and um i think that the the btc economy is uh is it is an unsustainable system that's that's uh, purely uh, based on um, exploiting this uh, land grab mentality and exploiting people who aren't really thinking about the the transition that Bitcoin needs to go through eventually. But uh, the system can't survive 
if uh, the um, uh, if the the hash rate can't be maintained, and uh, there there isn't there isn't any um, any reason to think that uh, that having having BTC in the future and and paying a lot for transactions uh, is going to be a, a viable way of maintaining that that hash rate. It's a much better way of doing business to um, to do a, a lot a, a lot of business in bulk and to keep things as cheap as possible um, and that's sort of that's sort of what uh, what uh, the the most successful businesses in history have all tried to do. And if you if you try to to start a business in BTC and uh, complain about well, if if you uh, if you're if you're concerned about the uh, the, the future uh, viability of uh, being able to to do transactions in uh, in BTC, they uh, uh, they they, um, they 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 just make make fun of you and people who've tried to um, Build build businesses on top of BTC have been uh, driven out. So I see BTC as a very uh, very anti business um, uh, uh, network. But really, it's it's only it's only because there's a lot of uh, of commerce in the future that a form of money is worth having now. Um, and so. Uh, uh, yeah, the the idea of BSV is that uh, we're, we're trying to um, we're we're trying to transition from this, this land grab period to uh, something that's uh, sustainable and based on uh, based on on uh, doing um, based on uh, earning earning income from doing useful stuff. Rather than just trying to uh, get all, all of the initial bitcoins as, as much as possible, uh, so uh, the uh, the uh, the initial um, uh, the the initial block reward the the subsidy that's like um, Bitcoin is uh, is a baby because it's getting uh, it's getting resources that are just being given to it. Uh, and but it has to grow during that time, and eventually it has to be out of uh, the the parents' basement, and it has to get a job. You know what I mean? That's that's what that's what we're doing in in BSV. We're trying to turn Bitcoin into something that is uh, has a has a job. So now Bitcoin is like a teenager, and it's uh, learning to uh, learning to survive on its own. So. For yeah, for, but I'm totally on board with the, what you're saying here. Is is are we then kind of in a race between uh, BSV's ability to attract commerce uh, to BSV and BTC getting these layer two solutions in play to be able to uh, reward miners for mining that blockchain? Is that is that kind of a very simplistic? Uh, view of, of, of where, where, where we're at over the next couple of years. Uh, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, ultimately, the uh, the the income earned from transaction fees has to exceed the income earned from uh, initial uh, block reward subsidy, and that has to happen as as early er, earlier is better. Um, and uh, but. Bitcoin really is a very uh, useful system. So once once people get the idea of uh, what it's capable of, I think uh, I think lots of people are are going to want to get in on it. Uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, I think that um, BTC has uh, promoted ideas about Bitcoin which make it uh, very uh, very useless, and they've convinced uh convinced the world that btc is what bitcoin is uh and uh, people need to think about what's 
what's possible. Well, when, when people start to realize what, what they can really do with BSV, um, I, I think that, that they, they are going to want to use it for all kinds of different things. Okay. Vincent, uh, you want to jump on in at this point? Um, uh, interesting, interesting points. So, uh, I'm, I have to, I just have to make the point that as, uh, in the, in Satoshi's white paper, uh, Bitcoin, which, um, we can argue whether it's really Bitcoin SV or, uh, Bitcoin core, uh, the point is made of, of the, the, the uh, Satoshi makes the argument he states the reason why there is a transition from the, 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 the release schedule, which halves and halves and halves, into a transaction fee market. Um, that point, that case is made in the white paper, and I don't see core uh, deviating from that um, idea that you should have, uh, as, as the block reward for miners decreases as the total amount of Bitcoins eventually become, have been released, uh, then you have an escalating fee uh, market whereby the network sustains its activity and its security. You know, as Daniel said earlier, the, 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 the miners, the, 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 hashing, the hashing process that miners do, uh, the proof of work uh, creates the history, creates the blockchain, and also protects it. You, you have to do so much work to disrupt that, that history of, of, of Bitcoin, that blockchain, that it becomes a self-defeating uh, objective. You know, you, you can't do it. As, as so the, the proof of work secures the blockchain. And as, as there are more and more transactions, as, you know, supposed global adoption, and there are more transactions, you've got the fee market sustaining it then since the Bitcoins are not being released anymore. They're all in circulation and being used. Uh, and I think that is a given, you know, that's the model. Will it be a smooth process from the beginning of Bitcoin of 50 Bitcoins, you know, every being released every 10 minutes uh, to eventually, you know, uh, I don't know what the minimum amount is going to be in the final years. You've got a few Satoshis being released every 10 minutes um, uh, and then suddenly nothing being released and the fee market must sustain it. Is that process going to be a smooth, uh, a linear process or, a, or a, 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 a sort of a hyperbolic or a, a, a linear regression? Is that what it's going to really be like? I don't think so. I think there's a lot of disruption ahead. I think that uh, the idea is sound. Uh, if we, I, I agree with Daniel that for money to be useful, there must be the promise of future commerce. Is um, SV, I'm not arguing uh, against SV uh, because I believe these experiments must happen. You know, forks are inevitable and, and the experiments must be made. If, uh, if enough people believe in ideology, fork and, and go in that direction, absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm not arguing that one is better than the other. I'm just arguing why I prefer one to the other. And I see no deviation of the Bitcoin core from the original white paper idea. Uh, specifically what you mentioned, Sean, the Lightning Network. The Lightning Network is, is a, a layered, is a, a, a scaled layering solution whereby Bitcoin becomes layer one which is effectively a settlement layer, but it you, anyone can still use it, but the fees are expensive because they need to be expensive by Satoshi's uh, design, right? Which we're stuck with. It's, it's almost like you, uh, ships are, are stuck with the fact that there are tides and that there is variation between spring tide and uh, spring high and spring low. Um, uh, so that is a given, that's a constant. And the, the global shipping network must adhere to that or, or be doomed, right? Um, the Lightning Network is a, is a logical extension of that idea that since Bitcoin transactions must become more and more expensive in the future, 
we need a layer where there is no mining riding on top of that layer, which we call layer two, the lightning network will provide unlimited, virtually unlimited transactions per day, fast, faster or virtually instantaneous, um, way outpacing, way outperforming the, 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 the Visa and the net and, and the, the MasterCard kind of network. And that lightning will will be completely anonymous this is going this is a, a logical extension of bitcoin and for me a completely natural sort of trajectory that it should go into this layered uh, solution and um i like it you know so the idea that a um, the future commerce that, that that daniel mentioned future commerce is important but is it can we rely on it? Can we, can, is there a guarantee in history that this is what is in our future? I don't think so because commerce is, is bound to cycles. Commerce happens in cycles and there is a business cycle that swings from high productivity to low productivity. And this is why that is, we don't know. Is it gravity, is it dark matter or is it human psychology? that builds, that, that, that goes into productive phases globally and then goes into unproductive, de destructive phases at other points in history. I think it's that. I think it's, it's, it's human psychology that we humans, uh, that human folly creates these economic cycles. And our current cycle is bound to end as well. And it will be interesting to see which version of Bitcoin will perform best and outlast? Uh, th that is my view on it. I, I, I don't know enough about the future. I'm, I'm an analyst. I'm a, I'm a technical analyst. And it's gonna, it's gonna be fascinating. And that brings me to my next question, yeah. which is then for you. Because and again, I just make my point. There's, uh, the, the, as a technical analyst, I've learned that you cannot predict the future. Yeah. You can only read the signs and and make a probabilistic bet. And and that's what I'm making on Bitcoin Core. Okay, so uh, would you also, purely from a uh, speculating, investing, uh, in short, medium term, would, would you uh, would you buy BSV? Um, For example, I'm I'm, I'm uh, obviously you know learning as much as I can about both projects. And when when pe obviously we're not giving financial advice here, but when people ask me what are, what are good investments in the space, I I certainly tell them to look closely at both BTC and BSV, uh, you know, half of them own 58 other goddamn altcoins. <laughs> these, you know, these are great projects. It's, uh, what are your thoughts around are that? You, are you asking me, a are you asking me whether I would, if you ask, are you asking me as a, as a, um, a Bitcoin sort of holder and a, and a core supporter, yeah, do you think, do you think uh, whether I would buy BSV? Yeah. I would okay. not. Do you I have a not. moral uh, issue with that? <laughs> You know, I've, I've, I've got a, I've not got a moral issue with it. Uh, if it's useful to me, yeah. if somebody, if something I wanted could only be bought with BSV, right? Right. I would change Bitcoin for BSV and buy the thing that I wanted. Right. So every time we're coming, I'm, I'm, I'm stepping out of Bitcoin. Um, yes, I would buy it, but would I buy it to hold it? Um, not necessarily. That would take some technical analysis and some price history for me to make that decision. Yeah, Daniel, I'll throw throw that question at you. Do you uh, do you sort of buy, uh, speculate, trade any anything uh, else on this market? Um, well, uh, I mean, I think that it's um, I, I'm I'm very careful about what what information I I actually say about Understood. what I've done. So I I would rather uh, not not answer that. Uh, but I would like to uh, respond to um, uh, Vinzin's comments about uh, the Lightning Network. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So um, the the reason that um, Bitcoin is a, a solution to the Byzantine generals problem is that it uses proof of work and um, uh, this it's an, an application of, of what's called the handicap principle. And the, the handicap principle says that it is rational to pay more attention to, uh, uh, to 
to people with bigger handicaps or not not necessarily people but but agents in in a game theoretic uh, um, uh, system so the, the handicap principle was originally um, uh, uh, proposed for uh, in in uh, theoretical biology as a way of explaining things like uh, the peacock's tail uh, and what uh, uh, Zahavi is the biologist who came up with it. So he said that the reason that the peacock's tail is a good signal of fitness is that um, uh, uh, it, it is a, a provable handicap. So if you are looking at, at the peacock, you don't, have to, you don't have to examine every little thing about him. Uh, you you know that that the tail is a handicap, so you know that he must be good enough to be able to produce it and uh, and live live sustainably carrying that that thing around. Um, and the, this principle uh, is used in Bitcoin uh, to to say that the the winner of the history contest is. Um, uh, is the the, um, the the miner who has the the biggest handicap, which is hash power in Bitcoin, um, or it's well, it's probabilistic. So um, on on average, if you have uh, more hash power, then you get more blocks, and that's a stable game because it's it's rational to pay more attention to uh, to agents with with bigger handicaps. And that's that's why we're able to get a consistent history in Bitcoin, um, uh, b because because this is a, a genuinely stable game, um, and uh, you don't you don't have a solution to the Byzantine generals problem without it. And the, the Byzantine generals problem. What that means is the network, uh, a network that has independent agents in it arrives at a, uh, a universal uh, final uh, conclusion about some, some, some question that it is initially uh, in, indeterminate about. And we do that all the time in Bitcoin because we solve the Byzantine or we solve the, the double spending problem, which is uh, a subset of the Byzantine generals problem. So, uh, every time um, when, when transactions are, are processed by the network, there's uh, potentially many possible other transactions that could have been processed by the network. But the, the network always settles on, on one out of all alternatives. That's not what the Lightning Network is, because the, the Lightning Network isn't built on that model, and it doesn't use proof of work to arrive at a consistent history. And um, in in BTC, because of the limited block size, there is a limit to the number of independent agents that can uh, can exist in the BTC network. Um, and if there are too many, then they start to interfere with one another because that the fees grow too high and it becomes prohibitive to make transactions. And the Lightning Network does not, uh, does not add to the number of independent agents that are possible on BTC because it's not a genuine solution to the Byzantine generals problem. So what will happen with the Lightning Network is that every time, um, every Every attempt at, at, at growth will result in uh, more more problems with, with people interfering with one another, and every step up will require um, new new Herculean solutions from the core developers because they they have forced themselves into a position where they they have to be central planners. Which means that they have to make um, they have to make all all the decisions about how people can uh, can interact without uh, without 
interfering with, with one another because they've abandoned the, the proof of work system. So in BSV, what we say is we're trying to process as many transactions as possible and as cheaply as possible. And that is what actually maximizes the number of independent agents that are possible in the, the BSV network. Um, or the, it maximizes the number of Byzantine generals. Oh, and um, uh, regarding uh, technical analysis and the uh, future, future uh, projection, um, I, I see Bitcoin, well, all capital markets as being like a, a, a game where um, you have to understand what what actions are genuinely sustainable? In other words, what is the best strategy in the game? And you have to compare um, compare what what you know about strategy to what other people know about strategy. And you have to project into the future about uh, how the other player's strategy will uh, will will fail or or succeed in the future. You have to find the best the best position uh, among everyone else. So um, so uh, I, I think that the Vincent's attitude, where he says he 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 doesn't try to uh, project the future, and uh, he he just looks at the signs in in the price charts. Uh, I think that is fundamentally an, an unsustainable strategy, I, and uh, nobody. Nobody who, who makes an investment in any of the coins is absolved of the responsibility of pro projecting into the future. And it's, if you invest in, in any, anything, it's your, it's your responsibility to project into the future correctly. And uh, I, um, I, I am sympathetic to his, his point that you can't, really see the future, but that, that just means that this is a very difficult game and it's very difficult to discover the correct strategy, but it, no, nobody is absolved of that responsibility. Uh, and the people who, who believe that they can, uh, they, they don't, don't need to do that. And then that they're not ultimately responsible for correctly predicting the future, they will lose all of their money in the future. Vincent. Okay, I, I would, yeah, I need to, uh, I just need to refine my, my definition. Then uh, technical analysis is the, uh, the analysis of a chart, right? So you, you can't technically analyze a, uh, a feeling or a fundamental. Right, you cannot you you uh, a fundamental event or the implication of a fundal, fundamental event or the or a strategy you cannot technically analyze. You can analyze trends on charts and therefore uh, build a strategy based on the technical analysis of a chart. So my my point was that what would I buy uh, is dictated by technical analysis of a price chart that, 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 that was my, my, my point there uh, in terms of strategies and, and making, uh, uh, you know, sort of formulating ideas about the success of a project uh, based on strategy. Yeah, that's also good because you're, you're, but you cannot do that with technical analysis. That is a, a different field. And then we're getting into game theory, right? Which is, uh, not a field of expertise. Of, of, uh, I, I don't know anything about that. I, I, I can't say I don't care about it, but it's not useful to me because I'm a, I'm a, a price chart trader. That, that's uh, my thing. So yeah, very interesting feedback, uh, Daniel. Very interesting feedback there. The Lightning Network, can I just say, uh, is not intended to be mined uh, because it, um, it's mined at layer one. So the Lightning Network is, happens at layer two uh, at much less expense and anybody can create a, a Lightning Network node, can build their own node, the software is freely available 
and relay those transactions. In fact, every person that uses Lightning becomes a node. So it, it, the number of agents, uh, it's not centralized, it's decentralized. It's a, it's a, it's, it, eventually it, 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 it falls back onto layer one. It, there, there's an unlimited amount of space in the Lightning network for people to transact. And as soon as you transact, you become a Lightning node. No less or more important than the next Lightning work no, yes, there are they are uh, hubs, there are relays, um, and those are open for competition. There is not a set price. Anybody can set the price at which they will relay a, a transaction. And if in some future disrupted network, uh, you happen to be on a segment of the network that works, of the the connect of the the, the connected network that works, uh, and you happen to be positioned there, well, then of course you're going to be more fortunate than a guy that is on the periphery or is has been cut off. Um, that's the principle of the, 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 not the principle, that's one of the effects of the Lightning Network for its users, one of the implications. Um, so the mining still happens at layer one because you've got you to make a transaction to get from Bitcoin into the Lightning Network. There, micro transactions happen and you can, uh, and, and they get mined again when the transaction, when a bulk of transactions get settled uh, as a single transaction back into the uh, Bitcoin layer one network, which is a brilliant solution, I think. I mean, it's, it's, it's just a stroke of genius. I don't know if most people can see the, sim the, the simple uh, elegance of it. Fantastic. Um, yeah, guys, look, I think you've uh, both spoken incredibly well tonight. I've uh, re real pleasure to have you both here. I'd, I'd love to do this again. So we're, we're heading for, for nearly two hours here, guys. So I think maybe uh, if we could, if you could both sort of finish up with uh, some closing remarks or just just to summarise your uh, your thoughts around Daniel uh, BSV and uh, Benzin, we'll, we'll, we'll finish off with you just with some final comments on uh, on, on BTC and. Uh, We'll uh, hopefully do this again in the very near future. So, Daniel, do uh, you want to maybe give us a quick summary of uh, of, of the chat? Um, well, um, I, I mean, I, I don't think I have anything else to to add. Uh, I had a, a lot of fun in this discussion, and so it was really nice to meet you, Vinzen, and uh, uh, um, uh, uh, gl glad I got gl glad got blah, excuse me glad I got to say so much. Um, that that's about it. I'll see you see you around. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Ben Zen. You want to uh, parting comments? Thanks, uh, thanks, Sean, for having us on. And uh, Daniel, nice to meet you and speak with you. Um, there are so many other things I, I wanted to get into. You know, uh, Bitcoin Foundation. Uh, some of the arguments against big blocks uh, posed by the principle of, of uh, you know, what, what's called the, uh, forced demand or, or induced demand. You know, you increase those block size, the block size, which agents will jump on it to fill that space and reestablish uh, uh, congestion. Uh, there, there's so much. It was nice to, to hear your, um, and informative to hear your, your, discussion and um, to learn from one of the original, you know, one of the guys that originally got into Bitcoin at the beginning of it. Yeah, uh, ab absolutely. Uh, and a, a, a real pleasure to uh, have a, a gentlemanly discussion, <laughs> which is quite, quite, quite rare uh, in this uh, very tribal space. So an absolute pleasure. You're uh, both true gentlemen and uh, I'd love to do this again in the, in the near future, if that's okay with you both. Well, I'll think about it, but uh, but thanks a lot. <laughs> thanks very much, Daniel. Yeah, pleasure. Hey, uh, will, will we see you in Asia in the in the near future? Uh, I don't don't think so. Um, no. I'm skipping CoinGeek. Uh, C C C O. I don't know how to pronounce that that city Soul. name. But Seoul. <laughs> Seoul. Okay. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, uh, I've been having to travel a lot uh, lately, so right. Uh, I'm kind of sick of it. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Excellent. Well, uh, once once again, thank thank you very much for for joining us, Daniel. It was uh, a, a real pleasure talking with you again.
Uh, thanks. Uh, you too. Okay. Ben Zen, thank you, sir. We'll, uh, we'll speak very soon. Okay. Thanks, guys.